Welcome back to the Gold Factor Podcast, your guide and gateway to a life of purpose and fulfillment. I'm your host, Bernadette Gold, transformation and high performance coach, here to lead you through another chapter of my audiobook, The Crooked Path to a Charm Life, a clairvoyant medium's journey to embracing her spiritual gifts. Now remember, each episode of season one is a new chapter in the book as we traverse the realms of the seen and the unseen. So let's dive in and continue our adventure together. It's time to think bigger, feel deeply, and act boldly. Chapter 24, Miracle in the Desert. In 2015, after eight years of ignoring a growing mass in my intestines, I was faced with the biggest cancer challenge of my life. A tumor the size of a softball that started as endometriosis tissue breached my abdominal wall, turning to colon cancer. Surgery wasn't an option, and I wasn't willing to risk chemotherapy or radiation treatment. Certain I wouldn't survive it. My health was beginning to fail on many levels. My family practitioner was agreeable to holistic treatments, making it easier to cope with the challenges of avoiding doctors. However, when my weight dropped, she became concerned with the mass in my lower intestines, mainly because it was now protruding. Surgery to remove the mass wasn't an option. The only treatment offered was chemo or radiation. If I were going to get rid of this tumor, I would have to do it quickly and naturally. Eating became both difficult and painful, leaving my energy levels deficient. However, I was stubbornly acting as if everything was fine. It wasn't until I was unable to eliminate my bowels without the assistance of an enema that I finally sought treatment. Treating leukemia wasn't as hard. I knew the supplements, herbs, the diet, and the protocol to treat myself. Unfortunately, treating this tumor was different, more painful, and way scarier. But I was out of options. First, I would need to tell my kids about the secret I'd been keeping. I booked a week in San Diego at a beach house at the beginning of March. Then, I arranged to have Grant, his girlfriend, his sister, and my best friend meet us for an epic party weekend. Brindy, her husband, and my granddaughter met us there. While I didn't disclose the reason for our vacation that weekend, I wanted to create great memories for everyone, just in case things didn't pan out the way I planned with my treatment. San Diego was both fun and stressful. My energy was low already. Needless drama caused by drinking and individual agendas made the trip rough. It was great to laugh and hang with my crew after so many years away, but my emotions were boiling. My boyfriend Ned tagged along, being the only one that knew what I was hiding. I wasn't aware that Ned had his own agenda, only coming along to visit his friend who lived there and surf. He spent most of the trip uninterested in anything but himself. I paid for the house rental and expected he would be thoughtful of my intention for the trip, wanting to spend time with me. Before leaving for vacation, unhappy with the room he was renting, Ned manipulated to move into my house, and things began to change after that. I found out later that Ned secretly talked to my son-in-law, pushing my daughter's family out of the house. Ned began to assert control over everything everything. It started on our way home from San Diego. From the passenger seat, Ned started a fight. Exhausted from cancer and driving the 10 hours home, crying, I struggled to keep the car on the road as he ranted about his displeasure that I needed to be left alone in the morning. Bella tried explaining that everyone knew that I took my time in the morning to remember my dreams and record any messages I received. Unfazed, 
Ned wasn't happy about that, nor did he care what I needed. My desire to wake up slowly in a sacred, intentional way interfered with his demands of sex in the morning. We weren't even halfway home, but I wished the drive was over as he continued criticizing me and his all-expense-paid vacation. Once home, I began colon hydrotherapy treatments with ozone, restricting my diet to almost nothing. I took countless supplements and layering medical marijuana patches and edibles with high doses of CBD and CBN. Several weeks passed, but the tumor wasn't shrinking. Ned was concerned. He called a friend in Arizona that's a Native American medicine man. Ned asked for his help. Miraculously, his friend agreed to meet me to see if he could do anything. I completely respect the Native American traditions, beliefs, and ways being similar to that of my ancestors. Being open to herbs, ceremonies, and even attending Native American church meetings was not a stretch for me. My biggest concern was that somehow they wouldn't accept me into their ways. I was wrong. They not only accepted me, but also welcomed me into their family and their teepee. They did so much to help me. We drove all over Arizona and even Northern California to attend Native American Church, NAC, meetings for months. Taking the medicine weekly and praying all night for others was such a blessing. I was also taking some Native herbs I received from the family in Arizona. The combination of everything I was doing was making a difference. But I needed to host my own NAC healing meeting. Arrangements were made to hold an NAC ceremony in Arizona in August 2015. There were many preparations to make it happen. Unfortunately, even as I was preparing for the ceremony, things with Ned deteriorated even more. In June, I wrote Ned this email after constant arguments that had him moving in and out of my house. I have written a short list of the complaints and things you have regarding my life, my home, and what you have attempted to change or want me to change. Number one, how I handle my business. Two, how I handle my family relationships. Three, how I handle my clients. Four, how the chickens are taken care of. Five, having the chickens. Six, having the dogs. Seven, having moto. Eight, how the yard is taken care of. Nine, how the kitchen is handled. 10, how we eat what we eat. 11, how the garden is watered. 12, what is planted in the garden. 13, having the garden. 14, how and what I think. 15, how and what I feel. 16, not humble enough. 17, don't exercise enough. 18, don't have enough sex. 19, work too hard. 20, don't rest enough. 21, my resistance. 22, the way I listen. 23, the way I talk. 24, how I communicate. 25, how I take care of things. 26, my independence. 27, my codependence. 28, the electric fence is wrong. 29, taking the lawnmower key out is wrong. 30, I'm not self-responsible. 31, ego. 32, I apologize like a child. 33, don't wake up the way you like. 34, grumble. 35, my emotions and emotional energy is too intense for you. 36, my abandonment issues, fears, past hurt that has caused me to be cautious or guarded. 37, vulnerability. I need to be free to be me, not to be constantly criticized, monitored, and controlled. 
I don't think you hear that. In order for me to heal the rest of this, I'm getting messages clearly that says, I need to re-empower myself and feel good about my life, my body, me, period. That you can't see how destructive these things have been to our relationship or me is worrisome. I, too, want to move forward, but we can't move forward until we resolve the past and change what is happening and has happened and continues to happen. The list is all over the place because you've literally found fault all over the place with me and my life. It has to stop. You talk about the power of words, and these are words you've spoken. What power do you think they have? Of course, it's all me again. My trust issues? Oh my God, you betrayed my trust. And of course, that's my fault too. Until you can see these as patterns in your life, it won't and can't change. I want to be well. I want to get this cancer done, out, over. I will stand up for myself. I liked my life before you came. I like my property, my business, my income, my family, myself. I have never stopped working on myself since I was an adult. I am putting up boundaries, limits of how I'm treated. I know you love me, but your issues have affected how that love is expressed. And until you see that, we can't move forward together. As long as you constantly say it's me, my issues, that create your criticism or control, there is nothing that can be done. I will go to counseling with you. You have the insurance. You have to set that up. Emotional healing is what has to happen now for the physical to heal. I am clearing everything I can, including this. I want respect for myself and my family. That is non-negotiable. It shouldn't even be a conversation. I have not demanded it. It has not happened. There was never an apology to my father for the night you left here screaming at him. You hid from him until he was leaving. In the meanwhile, you have continually tried to make everything be done your way. If it isn't, you complain, criticize, and cut down. I've lived here for 15 years and tried lots of ways of getting stuff done in that time period with a lot more animals and people in this house. I've kept it running smoothly for years. Bills paid, jobs done, kids fed, emotions soothed. You walk in and act as if everything is wrong. I can't take that anymore. I did not, I repeat, walk into your life and try to change you, distrust you, question you. You did that to me. It is a fact. I paid the price in tears, repressed feelings, pain. It doesn't just go away because you say, I'm sorry. As you said, that's a child's apology. You have to earn that trust back once you betray it, not just sweep it under the rug. It's been three weeks. Drop discussion. No more. I'm just supposed to get over it all. Meanwhile, handle everything alone because you aren't present when you are home, if you are home. I love you. I want a healthy, equal partnership, not one in which I fully submit to you, and there is no equal exchange. We have to both feel good about decisions, not just one of us. You are used to making all the decisions. No kids, no animals, no commitments. I am used to making decisions based on what is best for the entire family, not just me. You should think about that. I may not have had a committed partner for the last 23 years, but I have been committed to caring for others for that long, if not longer, and held that commitment. I have lived with others the entire time I've been on this property, too. Husband, children, 
animals, friend, father, and boyfriend. I've juggled it all and kept it going, managing to create what I wanted in my life. I am not making blanket always statements, but these are things that can't keep happening. Actions have to be taken to repair past damage. You can't just pretend it didn't happen. I've suggested we schedule dialogues with Imago. That hasn't happened either. You agreed to it, saying we need to work through the stuff, but then complained to me yesterday. You've spent so much time on this relationship. Well, so have I. And I don't complain to you about the energy it takes. If you want to let it all go, that is fine. If you want to work on it and improve it, then we need a solid plan and commitment to get that work done. It does take time, energy, and consistent effort. You stated you needed a lot of alone time yesterday. My immediate feeling and reaction were fine. Take it. Be alone. I confess that was a reaction and defense. But at the same time, what else am I supposed to feel? You have lived most of your life outside of committed relationships, not in them. You need a lot of alone time, and perhaps you are happier alone. I wish I could say the email improved things. It didn't. I received a scathing email in return, but Ned wouldn't leave. He just got better at manipulating me. By July, my dad moved to California to live with my brother. He couldn't deal with Ned anymore. Ned had no respect for my dad, doing anything and everything he could to drive a wedge between us. Weak and confused, I couldn't see what was happening clearly. Finally, I yelled at both of them to stop fighting. In the end, Dad left, unable to stay, knowing Ned wasn't going to take care of things around the property. So I was so upset when he moved, knowing I was left with double the work. It felt like no one understood or cared that I was sick. It was the opportunity Ned needed to try to get me to sell the property. He tried to convince me we could find another property to buy together. In truth, he wanted me to sell the house and put his name on a new property. Thankfully, I was too weak and sick even to consider it. I eventually learned he had a way of doing things like that to benefit himself. July was a difficult time for me. Dad was gone. I was driving myself to all my ozone treatments while treating myself at home. I worked every day, taking calls and teaching my charm life class weekly. I was exhausted from doing three to four enemas a day to detox my liver, lymph, and colon. I spent a lot of time hiding in my room, unable to climb the stairs to get to my office. Then one day, the pain in my stomach was so bad I couldn't get off the bathroom floor. In tears, I prayed for help, questioning whether I was going to live through the cancer. I decided to write letters to my daughters, just in case I didn't survive. I made a video for Brindy, including pictures of all the things we've done, accompanied by her song, Sandcastle Dreams. I wasn't giving up, but I was no longer confident I would get through it. Between self-treatment and the emotional roller coaster I was on with Ned, I was drained on all levels. August 8, 2015. After four days of cooking, we arrived in Arizona. Ready for my NAC meeting, grateful my cousin Bernie and my daughter Bella attended. Even though I knew the meeting was focused on healing cancer. I had no idea how hard it would be. I can't divulge details of the ceremony, but I will share 
some of my experiences that night. Sometime after midnight, one of the elders said something that completely shifted my consciousness. Whether a vision or dimensional shift, I suddenly found myself under the fire, the coals. I couldn't breathe. I believed I was dead. I remember telling Ned my heart wasn't beating and that I wasn't breathing. He didn't understand why I was saying that since my eyes were open and to him, I looked fine. I was watching my funeral, watching as my casket lowered into the ground, thinking it was happening in real life, yet it was only a vision. I wanted to leave, asking him if we could go home. Then he disappeared, the funeral disappeared, and I was in the center of the earth, connected to the roots of the medicine. The roots lit up, as did my body. As soon as my body began to glow, I knew I was going to live. Suddenly, my consciousness returned to the teepee as the meeting continued for several more hours. Sitting there as the sun rose the following day, I was flooded with gratitude for every person in the teepee. I was grateful for every ancestor that aided in my healing. I thanked Creator and felt overwhelming peace, joy, appreciation. I thanked everyone for coming and for their prayers on a tough night as the meeting ended. I declared I was healed, knowing I was. When I felt my stomach, the lump was gone. Stumbling out of the teepee in the morning, I was grateful for a helping friend, Eric. He grabbed my arm and helped me walk around the teepee to complete the ceremony. Ned had gone ahead of me, unaware that I could barely walk. No one seemed to notice Ned's disregard except Eric, my cousin, and Bella. The blessing of the healing outweighed everything else. Thinking back on the beauty of the meeting, I understood the sacred rotation of everything reflecting the sun, the moon, the earth. To me, the fire represents God's creative and destructive force, and the water represents the emotional, nurturing force. The sacred movement of the instrument symbolizes how we communicate with God, how our bodies move around on the planet and how the earth revolves around the sun. The ceremony is done with conscious movement, thought, intention, and emotion, all in order, no chaos. Within the teepee, all earthly problems are brought before the fire as an offering, a sacrifice, held by the community as you sit up all night in prayer and communion with God. I witnessed the holiness of the feminine nurturing and life-giving energy represented by the woman bringing in the water that delivers sustenance and relief to the family around the fire or, metaphorically, around the world. The fire purifies, the water soothes, and sustains. The smoke carries the prayers to the throne of the Creator. I viewed the orientation of the teepee as the womb. As the sun rises, it gives birth into the physical, heralding the divine entrance of life and creation into this reality and dimension. During the midnight hours, anything blocking you from connecting to the Creator is purified. It's the most challenging part of the meeting. Feeling tired and worked over by the heat of the fire as you become aware of every fear, ego, concern, or worry. You feel like quitting, just like life. The hardest part is when the fire is testing you. But when the 2 a.m. window is reached, things begin to lighten, burdens begin to lift, and gratitude replaces suffering. I will forever be grateful for the sacred fire and the beautiful Native American family that embraced me. There are no words to describe the wisdom of indigenous ways. It is pure experience, connection, and honor for all beings. 
the ego must be laid down and the heart opened in a humble way to receive the blessing from our loving creator. Returning home, I had to continue ozone therapy and treatment for a couple more months. The mass was gone, but liver functions hadn't fully returned. After the meeting, I began to experience severe depression. Depression wasn't something I had dealt with in many years, but suddenly I was crying, losing my mind and feeling very confused. Ned was blaming me for anything and everything. Finally, Ned decided I needed help understanding the changes I had to make for him to be happy. <laughs> so I agreed to see a counselor with him, one who specialized in cancer grief. Little did I know, this counselor would change my life and in many ways, save it. Our first intake session with Duane was to provide context and history. I chose him because he had experience with narrative therapy, which Ned studied to get his degree in social work. Ned also interviewed Duane before confirming the appointment, explaining I was sick and how the sickness impacted our relationship. The session began with Ned telling Duane all the things about me causing the issues. First, he didn't want me spending so much time with my granddaughter and didn't like that I could not meet all his needs. Before ending the session, Duane asked Ned how my sickness factored into our relationship and my inability to meet his demands. Ned brushed over the question as if I had a cold. I couldn't believe what I heard as silent tears fell down my cheeks. Duane asked me how I felt about it. Speaking quietly, I said, I've been battling colon cancer. I don't understand what more I can do. Duane looked shocked but remained quiet. Our session ended with the agreement to schedule another session. Thankfully, Dad and I took separate cars so he could go straight to work after the appointment. As I drove home, the floodgates opened, and I couldn't stop crying. Praying, I heard spirit whisper, call Dwayne and speak to him privately. I dialed Dwayne's number and asked if he could counsel me over the phone in private sessions. I explained Ned couldn't know about it, but that I needed some help. He agreed to keep our sessions confidential and quickly scheduled a session. Journal entry 9415. Feeling sad for two weeks, counseling yesterday brought up a lot. I've been able to suppress my emotions for several months, but they want to come out. I think because I was so ill and full of pain, I didn't want to break. Realizing when Duane asked how the illness played into this and having it glossed over really shook me up. Truly, Ned has left several times, withdrawn his love, placing more and more demands on me throughout this ordeal. Now I know he'd instantly say, I do not appreciate what he has done or how much he has taken on. The reality, though, is not much. Yeah, a family. But that is a given. If he didn't like it, he could have opted out. Dad is gone, and I've had to take on a ton because of it. How do I feel? Sad, grieving, alone. My dad left in the midst of my battle with cancer, on my word, that Ned would help. He has done only what he wants. Sadly, he had no clue. I was not expressing myself. He says I don't listen or care, but that is a projection. Not true. He's been given a lot and appreciates or acknowledges very little. Yes, all things that created the cancer are all things that want a voice. So I write, my appointment with Duane is Wednesday. Ned did the tit for tat when I told him I'd be seeing him alone. I figured I better tell him, because if he found out, he would be furious. Of course, he started saying he wanted to meet with Duane alone too, 
since I couldn't handle his emotions. So many weapons were used to hurt me. Why? It hurts that my sickness hurt me. It hurts that Brindy avoided me. It hurts that people are so selfish they can only see what they need and not what someone in need of support and love needs. I fought for God, for my family, and for him. Do they care? Does it matter to anyone? My heart is aching, and it feels like it's being squeezed. Ned said he wants and needs agreeable communication. What he means is that I listen, agree, and support him, and that everything he says is right. Dwayne said, actions are an important part of relationships, not just language, in response to Ned praising his own use of language. I feel put down, like a child. Ned said I couldn't communicate. It's wrong, hurtful, insulting, and attacking. I've allowed his projections and attacks throughout my whole cancer battle, but they've grown. They have started gaining momentum. He is always right, must always be right, even when he's wrong. I'm tired. I'm sad. I release all this pain tied to the unfairness of it all. And I'm tired of Ned adding to the weight of it rather than being loving and supportive. He thinks and says he knows what's best for everyone, but especially me. He's full of shit. That first private session with Duane was an eye-opener. He confided in me that he had no idea I had cancer. Ned had only mentioned I had an illness. As our session continued, he told me to research narcissistic personality disorder and that we would talk about it in our next private session. Researching narcissistic personality disorder explained more than just my relationship with Ned. It identified and defined the relationship I had with my mother. Keeping my research secret, I began to understand I was in a cycle of narcissistic abuse from Ned. Narcissistic Personality Disorder, NPD, the DSM criteria. Narcissistic Personality Disorder, NPD, is listed in the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, DSM, as an axis to cluster B, dramatic, emotional, or erratic disorder. A pervasive pattern of grandiosity in fantasy or behavior, need for admiration, and lack of empathy, beginning by early adulthood and present in a variety of contexts, as indicated by five or more of the following. One, has grandiose sense of self-importance. Example, exaggerates achievements and talents, expects to be recognized as superior without commensurate achievements. Two, is preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love. Three, believes that he or she is special and unique and can only be understood by or should associate with other special or high-status people or institutions. Four, requires excessive admiration. Five, has a sense of entitlement, i.e., unreasonable expectations of especially favorable treatment or automatic compliance with his or her expectations. Six, is interpersonally exploitative, i.e., takes advantage of others to achieve his or her own ends. Seven, lacks empathy, is unwilling to recognize or identify with the feelings and needs of others. Eight, is often envious of others or believes 
that others are envious of him or her. Nine, shows arrogant, haughty behaviors or attitudes. Dwayne advised me to consider leaving the relationship during my next phone session with him. With the continuing cycle of narc abuse, he was very concerned that if I stayed with Ned, cancer wouldn't entirely go away. The stress of the relationship was taking its toll on every part of my life, from finances to work to my relationships. Bella and Brindy couldn't stand him, watching helplessly as my physical and mental health deteriorated. I took Duane's advice seriously and began to pay close attention to what was happening. With his constant demands, criticisms, and growing resentment, I had the perfect opportunity to end things. Using what I had learned about narcs, I sent him an email telling him I couldn't change due to all I had on my plate. I knew he wouldn't be happy unless I changed. So I felt it better to end things so he could be happy. To my delight, he agreed. Ned's response was something to the effect that we were on the same page. He announced he'd be moving but wouldn't pay rent for the time he remained. I refused to let him stay any longer, especially rent-free. Within two weeks of the breakup, Dad moved back from California. By the end of the year, I was cancer-free and healed on many deep levels. In addition, I healed deep wounds from my mother issues that created so much pent-up anger. It wasn't easy, but... I learned a lot. Many miracles, helpers, and healers, including the very special Native American family, came to aid me in fighting for my life. I have closed out and healed from the many things that created cancer in my body. Celebrating a new beginning in August of 2018, three years after the tumor disappeared. It was a monumental battle for me that includes things I have vowed not to write about, to uphold the sacredness of the healing. I genuinely believe there are natural cures available to heal disease. If you have faith, determination, and commitment, Spirit will guide you to the miracles, people, and cures you need. Journal Entry 91815 I just watched the movie, The Fault in Our Stars. The film brought up a lot of thoughts and feelings for me due to my own cancer battle. Most people will never know the intensity of facing a life-threatening illness, but those who have know the thoughts that accompany it. If I die tomorrow, I am grateful for what I know to be true about my life and me. If my heart stops beating, my lungs stop breathing, I know I love deeply and gave everything I had to give. I know that no matter what has happened to me in this life, it has a purpose. Whether that purpose was to teach me forgiveness, patience, tolerance, or simply unconditional love, it all had a purpose. Most people choose to battle their cancer using Western medicine's treatment of surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. I have battled cancer alone using alternative therapies. I fought it in bed, from the bathroom floor, and in my mind. Most people in my life have no idea the extent of the pain I've endured, both physically and emotionally. Not to mention the daily mental battles to overcome fear, doubt, sadness, and despair. I've made it through each day drinking nasty herbs, driving to colon therapies, taking endless supplements, and searching for cures with my head held high. I've done it alone. 
without doctors, nurses, or a team of caretakers. I've continued working, helping others, and caring for my children as if I were well. I may not be doing everything as perfectly as I would if I was well or as quickly, but I push through each day as best I can, even when I want to scream out loud, throw a tantrum, or even quit fighting. I'm not saying I didn't have support. I did. I've had the love, acceptance, and help of God's human angels appear in my life at just the right moment. My loved ones, while concerned, can only offer support for a battle that I have to fight alone. Until a couple of months ago, my dad lived here. He checked on me incessantly, tried to cook for me even though I couldn't eat most days. I worked every day, do what chores I can accomplish, and keep the bills paid on time. Food on the table, meals prepared, business growing, gardens watered, and animals as well as kids are taken care of. When it's time for self-treatments, I hide in the bathroom and administer painful enemas while crying silently. At night, when the pain is the worst, I hide it and try to fall asleep as quickly as I can to attempt to outrun it. During my NAC ceremony, my dear friend said to me, no child should have to care for their parent. What she didn't know or realize is that my children didn't have to take care of me through this. My youngest daughter, who is 13 years old, helps with chores at times and helps with my granddaughter when she is here. If I stay in bed for the day, she checks on me to be sure I have water, but she never has to take care of me. I haven't stopped living because of this disease. I try not to complain about my pain or even let anyone know how much pain I'm in. I've hidden it from everyone. Why? Because I love you. I love you enough to not burden you when it so obviously scares you. I hide it because sharing it will not decrease its effects on me, but could potentially overwhelm you. Instead, I spend time with you, cook for you. I'm fighting for my life to spend another day with you. As I sit writing, all I can think is that this battle is not over. So I wonder, if this were my last day, did I feel loved? Did I love? Did I give? Did my life count? I did my best to help others remain peaceful, be thoughtful, give, grow, and stay connected to God. Was I successful at it? Can one ever be sure? What I am sure of is I loved deeply, hurt deeply in silence, struggled greatly, and remained loyal to God and my calling. No one will ever really know the amount of sheer effort it took to get through these last several months or even several years. But I know, and more importantly, God knows. Was it worth it? Yes. Love is always worth it. Does it matter? It does to me. I know that I have done what I can to recognize beauty, love, and to spread it, even when I feel like crap. I know that I got up every single day in gratitude and hopefulness for another loving day, the gift of life. So if tomorrow doesn't come for me, I did my best with what I had. It is enough for me. And when I leave this physical body, I will fly. I love my kids, I love my family, and I love all the people who've crossed my path. I've tried to be kind and sometimes failed, but I gave it my best as a human. I've spent years working on myself, studying, growing, healing past trauma, hurt, and illness. 
through all of it, I've grown, and I like myself. So if today is my last day, I am grateful for the experience and opportunities I've had. For love I gave and received, it has been a good life. I don't think I'm dying from this cancer. I believe it's just a bump in the road, a bump that is spiky, rough, and unpredictable. If God grants me one more day, I will cherish it and make use of it to be a loving, gentle human upon this beautiful earth. The best gift in life is to have the choice in how we live and express our humanity. I'm proud of who I am and the person I've become. I'm not perfect, but I like myself. That is all anyone can ask. Studying and learning everything I could about narcissistic personality disorder gave me much understanding of the struggles I faced with abuse. Spirit deepened that knowledge with visions and clarity of how the spirit of narcissistic people was injured. It might surprise you to know that many narcs are empaths that were wounded early in life. Instead of coping with their trauma, they turned all feelings off for others, only focusing on themselves. It is true that hurt people hurt other people. Empaths and sensitives are the perfect food source for the ego of the narcissist. Naturally, wanting to heal others by loving them, we draw them to us. They seek the qualities they lack, searching for the emotional feed we provide. For many years, I was hurt by the projections and callousness of narcs without understanding the dynamic. After years of clearing my old programs, fears, and self-doubt, light flooded my entire being when I finally had a name for it. I am forever grateful for that counselor who quickly identified the narc in my life and encouraged me to leave. There were too many times in relationships I felt like there was something wrong with me to evoke such cruel treatment. It's crazy when someone takes credit for things you did right and projects their own bad behavior onto you. Reality becomes fuzzy, and you are afraid to speak or act. Unsure of what truth is, you question everything. The cycle of narcissistic abuse became clear once I understood it. Love bombing, idealized treatment, quickly turns to devalue and ends in dismissal or discarding. In the beginning, the narc builds you up, telling you all the things you ever wanted to hear. You believe that you are finally being seen, heard, and understood. Without warning, the narc begins to criticize and complain, exposing any fault or fear you have. If that weren't enough, the narc then dismisses you, turning cold, giving you the silent treatment. You try hard to please, craving for the original love and attention. Empaths naturally want to please the people they love, giving everything possible. Before long, you're drained, exhausted, and unable to give to yourself or anybody else. As an empath, I never understood or comprehended that people couldn't feel empathy for others. I knew I felt the emotions of others as my own, but I didn't know how it deeply affected my reactions or behaviors. Once I understood it, another narc came along, plugged into my emotions, and was able to steal the energy I freely offered. Faced with cancer, you realize you only have so much energy. I had to choose to save myself emotionally, mentally, spiritually, financially, and physically. But the narc had no empathy for me. At the same time I was going through the cycle with him, my mother began to use my struggle as a personal attention plea. With so little energy, 
I had limited conversations with her. Most of what she knew came from her reading my blog or Facebook posts. I received an email from her after seeing a post she wrote on Facebook. The email was accusatory, making her the victim. She used my struggle with cancer to get attention from others. I cut all contact after reading. Go gentle into the night, my daughter. Peace and love are with you. God's grace be upon you. My instant reaction was, I'm not going to die. Who the hell writes something like that to their own child fighting colon cancer? I chose to end all contact, accepting that she is who she is. During my healing ceremony, I battled the hurt, anger, and resentments that I carried in my body from the relationship with my mother. I had to release it all and let it go. I had to accept that she was one of my greatest teachers in life. It was her choices and actions that led me always to put love first. From a very young age, I thought of her any time I had a big decision that potentially benefited me, but could be hurtful to others. I would ask myself, what would she do? And then I'd do the opposite. Before we are born, we choose the family, circumstances, and life that will cause the most significant opportunity for soul growth. There was no mistake in the life I've led or the family I was born into. Each person has offered me an opportunity to learn. Some lessons took much longer, but rising above the actions of others and no longer personalizing it allowed me to discover the truth of who I am at a higher level. We are individual expressions of God, infinite intelligence. Sometimes we wear distressing masks on our journey to remembering who we are. Yet, beneath the mask, God resides. As we muddle around this planet, trying to become a better version of ourselves, we all find our way, eventually. Some find their way early in life, others at the last breath. I'm still learning, growing, and remembering who I truly am. I am grateful for the lessons, even the pain, and discomfort of disease. If I hadn't been through so much in my life, I wouldn't have the knowledge, wisdom, or skills to help others. Life is a confusing journey. It's filled with ups and downs, just like an amusement park. We would be bored if it weren't for the roller coasters. Thanks for joining me on this episode of the Gold Factor Podcast. Want some free resources? Well, join my Facebook community, a group of heart-centered, ambitious individuals just like you. Just go and visit the link in the description, or you can go to facebook.com forward slash groups, the Gold Factor. And remember, if you're enjoying the book so far, follow the podcast leave a review. I really appreciate it as we're launching and growing the podcast and share it on social media. All right. I'll see you in the next episode. Have a great day. Be blessed and be a blessing.